Hello, my name is Giorgos Tabunaris, and this is Ars Electronica Home Delivery Inside Future Lab. Glad to have you here virtually. Today, we have for you something very special, an audiovisual art piece broadcast made by two of this year's artists in residence, or artists in resonance, as we would call, because due to the COVID situation, the residency is currently online. What you are about to see today is an output of an ongoing work made by Caroline Sinders and Anna Riedler. Caroline is an artist and machine learning researcher fascinated by languages, culture and images. And Anna Riedler is an artist and researcher especially interested in working with collection of information, particularly self-generated handcrafted datasets. They teamed up together for the residency project called AI Isn't Artificial But Human, which is an artistic exploration of the human aspects, inputs, and decisions involved at each step of creating an AI. Caroline is here with us live on the screen next to me. Uh, and unfortunately is not able to join us, but she sends us her warmest regards. So, hello, Caroline. So Caroline Hi. will be happy to answer your questions later. And of course, here with me uh, in Deep Space 8K is my dear uh, colleague and co-host, Jessica Gallero, who coordinates our EU projects and uh, therefore she's in charge of handling the residency framework that brought Anna and Caroline to Ars Electronica, the AI lab. So Jessica, could you please tell us a little bit more about this? Okay, thanks for the intro first, Yorgos. <laughs> and um, so the AI lab is short for European Artificial Intelligence Lab. That is um, a new funded project that was initiated in 2018 by Ars Electronica. Together with 12 cultural institutions across Europe, we offer lots of different activities on the topic of AI, um, such as exhibitions, conferences, workshops, and also residencies. Our residency program offers artists who work in the field of AI or are dealing with its impact on our society to take a residency at a scientific institution or at the Ars Electronica, or not, not or, but and at the Ars Electronica Future Lab, sorry about that. So, um, altogether, we had four residency calls so far. Anna and Caroline are the winners of the second residency call that was developed together with the Experiential AI Research Group at the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is part of the University of Edinburgh. And today, we have the chance to get a first peek at what Anna and Caroline have been working on and will continue working on in the next few months. Both Anna and Caroline explore the process of artificial intelligence as a form of creative practice in their artworks. And as Jorgos already mentioned, this involves creating their own data sets. The title of the project is called Cypress Trees, A Beginning. And as the title suggests, the data sets they collected and are working with are on Cypress trees, in this particular case, a genus that is native to the US. So, uh, in the next few minutes, you are going to see an audiovisual piece that, um, you, where you can explore the experiences of nature that can be mediated by, that, um, by technology. Mm -hmm. So, please just lean back, put on your headphones, and take in the experiences. And without much further ado, let's start the video.
That was quite relaxing. So, Caroline, could you please explain to us what did we just watch? Sure. Um, so what you've watched is a, a work in progress and kind of a, a meditative experience. And um, it's, a, it's a culmination of a few things Anna and I have been playing with. So at, at the beginning of the pandemic, that's when we actually kicked off our, our residency. Anna and I were both thinking about how we felt really isolated and we were also really missing nature. And out of that kind of provocation, we created a web ex experience, um, like a really small project that um, the Edinburgh Futures Institute put online. And that that's sort of separate than what you've seen, but it's a very similar genesis in a way, a kind of similar feeling. We wanted to create these really reflective and meditative uh, visual experiences pulling from pulling from data sets we've been assembling and that would would um, would sort of highlight this strange artificial moment we're in where we're engaging across many different screens and so this uh, what you're looking at is a culmination of some of the images we've been photographing for our electronica residency of Louisiana um, but manifested into this audio and visual experience I see. So anyway, we can say that COVID also had a huge impact to your project. And uh, totally. we, yeah. Yeah, we actually have already a question from our audience, which is, they are very curious to hear what Caroline is saying about the data set. They saw a different artwork of Caroline and Anna. If they, rem if they remember correctly, this one was only oceans. And this might be a newer version. Yeah, so the ocean one that person is referring to is that web experience we made with, um, with the Edinburgh Futures Institute that we came up with in the very beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. And what you're looking at here is I traveled back home when, uh, when the cases were starting to really um, lighten in, in Germany last summer. And I went to go see my family because I thought it would be the last time I'd be able to see them for a really long time. So I spent, um, I spent a few weeks, um, more than a month in Louisiana with my family. And so these images are from, from that trip. And it's uh, me visiting different parts of, um, of Louisiana and Mississippi and uh, exploring different swamps. What you see here in the deep space is actually where the swamp land starts to turn into the Gulf of Mexico. It's where the it's where a part of Louisiana just turns completely into water. So it was more like a nostalgic mood, let's say. Yeah, I think we're playing with a bunch of different themes here, and some of those themes we explored in this earlier smaller piece. So mm -hmm. in that earlier piece, this person's referring to Anna and I created data sets out of images we had already taken from our iPhones prior to the pandemic. And it was us reflecting on isolation. We had, we both really love the water, so we had a lot of images of water on our phones, and a lot of just things we had taken to, to document, you know, our personal lives prior to the pandemic. Um, and that was us thinking about isolation and grief. And in this case, what we're exploring with the cypress trees is is a bit bigger. It's a little less about isolation, but it is about the, um, the different kinds of spaces and environments we inhabit. The cypress trees here actually make up, um, make up different kinds of swampland and marshland, and those are natural barriers against hurricanes. In Louisiana, the state where I'm from, um, is, uh, loses about like a football field size of, of land mass like every mm -hmm. few minutes. And so it's like slowly disappearing. And climate change is only sort of heightening that disappearance. As the water rises, we lose more land. And so the cypress trees help protect the area, the state, from, from things like hurricanes, which are very naturally occurring. There's a hurricane season every year. Um, but um, as the state of Louisiana and surrounding areas like Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama, and Texas, as they've been dredged for oil and petroleum services and products, um, it's created these spaces where salt water comes into the fresh water and starts to kill the cypress trees. And so in this trip, we were on, I was on a boat with someone we were 
social distance, both wearing masks. Um, and the further we'd go out in the water, the more you could see the cypress trees start to die. And what was left were these kind of haunting, haunting images of the cypress trees, really, where they're just sort of these long sticks yeah. um, just out in the water, these sort, of, these sort of dead ghost trees. And so part of what's interesting about this project is it is, it's an archive in a way. Some of these trees, maybe 10 or 15 years from now, maybe won't exist anymore. And so these are almost like History. a documentation yeah. of that. Yeah. Got it. Super interesting. And uh, I'm also curious to, to tell us about this relaxing soundscape yeah. that we saw in the video. What was about that? Um, so part of that soundscape comes from sounds we've recorded, um, some sounds that um, you know we had recorded on our phones prior. And uh, that pulls from part of the earlier web experience where we ran those sounds, again, through, um, through a, a GAN system built for audio, um, or mm -hmm. like a kind of GAN-like system built for audio. Um, Anna and I are really interested in sort of exploring the tensions of um, of, of like artificially engaging with nature right now in this moment, which is what one of the earlier projects touches on. Um, but we also are, you know, for us, I think nature is something incredibly important to us, but also is a meditative experience, sort of sitting and looking at the water or listening to the water, there's a rhythm to it. And, um, you know, in some of these cases, or in some of these areas that we're documenting, um, we are thinking about will what will this area feel like or look like 10 or 20 years or 30 years down the line? Um, will the water be here? Um, where, where will it be? And so in some of these meditative experiences, it's also us um, thinking about trying to connect to the subject matter. So it is the meditative experience gives us a space to think about that and reflect. I see. And. Uh... Another question that is just posted right now is if there are any plans on continuing this project uh, and probably you, you already described how big impact was COVID for your project right now. Uh, the question is, is it going to be continued after the residency is finished? Uh, yes, totally. Anna and I are, are not done yet. Um, so the, the project is sort of fostered and facilitated by the residency, but it's not constrained to the time of the residency. So she and I have plans to continue it. Um, we've been trying to figure out what the endpoint will be, but we both know that the project will kind of tell us when it's time to be done. Yeah. And um, what about the Ars Electronica Festival? Are you going to participate? So, yeah, we, we, I mean, we plan to, we definitely plan to. So um, we have a few ideas for what's gonna be installed in the festival. Um, I think we're still sort of figuring out mm -hmm. what, um, what the exact shape will be, but it, you will, there will definitely be something there to see with this project. I'm sure be, because people are asking also for other works of yours. Yeah. And uh, basically they already ask if, uh, where, where there are other uh, works that they can see, works of yours um, so and Anna's. Yeah, so Anna, Anna and I came together for this project um, in a way that is really special. Um, I had been a big fan of her work, she'd been a big fan of my work, and we kind of came together in the way that, I guess, you know, sometimes different musicians come together to release an, a, a special album. Um, so she and I are collaborating on this project together, and it's really beautiful. My um, other work is just on my website, carolinecinders.com. Um, Anna's work, if you want to check it out, it's absolutely beautiful, is at annaridler.com. Nice. And apart from the Arts Electronica Festival, uh, are you going to show your work in another exhibition? Or where people could see your work? Yeah, um, I think we're open at some point. Yeah, I, th I think we're, <laughs> we're open to this project being shown places. Um, you know, it's still a work in progress, mm -hmm. um, but we, we hope that it's going to get shown in the future. Okay. I see. 
Maybe, I hope so. <laughs> sorry, maybe also yeah. a few questions about your residency, what your plans are going sure. to be in the next few months, uh, what you want to work on in the next yeah. period. So. I mean, our plan for the next few months is trying to figure out lockdown willing of when we get to finally mm -hmm. visit Lens and be mm -hmm. in the lab. So that is our, that's our, our next thing we're aiming for. Um, so all we can kind of do is wait and see what happens and hope, hopefully we get to come this summer. And then I think for us, then the next milestone after that is putting together our presentation and installation for, for the Biennale for Ars Electronica. I can ask some technical questions as well, so... Oh no, I hope I can help. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so what about the sound? What software, what software did you use or what means did you use to create this sound, to produce this Ooh, sound? That is more of an Anna question. Okay. I'm actually not quite sure. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, Anna is not here right now, as we no. said before. And uh, I would also ask about the machine learning API and what libraries did you use? So I think you are more expert into that. So you can yeah, enlighten so us a little bit. So I'm not sure the exact libraries we've been using, but we've been using a system that Anna has set up that works really well for her. I do know she uses some variation of like some pre-existing models that she is then extremely customized for her own workflow. Yeah. I understand. So I guess, do we have any other questions? I don't have any questions at the moment, but I think we can manage to we ask, you know, uh, yeah. Anna Riddler and forward yeah. uh, the Actually questions. Actually, there is already one more question. Ah, Sorry then to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. let's <laughs> make this the last yeah. question. <laughs> so, uh, okay, last question. Maybe it's not the last question, but for now. For now yeah. So <laughs> how would you say are your practices different from each other? I suppose, between you and Anna. Sure. Um, I would say they're very different and then also at the same time very similar. I think we're both really concerned and interested about the like materiality of AI and also the intentionality of creating a project. Um, mine, I think, is a bit more like speculative design and critical design focused and Anna's is, is more of a fine arts practice. Um, so in my own practice feminist data set, that's using intersectional feminism as an investigatory framework to the AI pipeline. And that involves like remaking and creating protocols and creating um, products to use. And so like within that, I will actually like make uh, a tool so I can, um, so I can actually like use the tool under like the lens of like feminist technology. Um, and so I would say my work tends to be a, a bit more in that space, um, which is sort of what has made it really fantastic to work with Anna. We're both very like, we're both very equitably minded around this sort of subject matter and area. Um, my work does tend to be a little more designing. Hers tends to be um, very beautiful uh, and critical fine art practice. Um, but that's where what makes the collaboration really, really lovely is that we um, were able to really sort of bounce ideas back and forth. Yeah. That's a good thing. And yeah. one last question. Yeah, sure. I think it has been already answered through your descriptions, but maybe our no audience worries. has joined also later. So maybe they have the chance to see the whole broadcast. So the question is, why are you focusing on cypress trees? So Anna and I are both from the American, uh, the American Gulf Coast, the American South. Um, Anna's family is from Georgia. Anna's, Anna's mother is from Georgia and has spent so much time in, in Atlanta. And I'm, I'm from New Orleans. I was born there. I've spent half my life there. I spent half, I spent half of the year there. I live between New Orleans and Berlin. Um, like I, you know, I, I own a, a house in New Orleans. Um, so, you know, I've, I've grown up with this landscape and I've also been reflecting over the past few years a lot on living, living in the age of climate change. Um, 
And these are also themes and topics that are very close to Anna's heart. Um, she cares a lot about climate change, a lot about the environment, and in her free time, spends a lot of time like working in that space. Um, so cypress trees for me are these iconic trees that I've grown up with, but they're also very evocative of, um, of the disappearing landscape, of the disappearing spaces. Um, there's a lot of work I've been thinking about doing in the future that I want to focus on that feels very New Orleans influenced in the sense of what, is it, what does it feel like to live with a changing climate? For example, in New Orleans, um, it's technically six feet underwater, so it's about two meters under sea level. So we're kind of surrounded by a, a series of levees and um, flooding is just a thing you deal with there. It floods all the time and it's a natural part of life there. And it's something I've been thinking about in the future where the things I've learned how to deal with growing up there is that the future or the reality of, of other cities, of having to learn how to navigate seasonal flooding, for example, of learning how to recognize when water is too deep to walk through or to drive through. You know, these, this is like a, a regular thing. Um, not saying it's a positive thing one has to live with, but it's a regular thing. And so for me, um, these are a lot of th themes I've been thinking about. Um, and the cypress tree is sort of, you know, this first manifestation of, of really engaging with that topic. Um, I also find them very beautiful and they're extremely evocative of the region. These little lines you see at the bottom of the tree, those are called knees and knobs. And that's actually the root mm -hmm. system, part of the root system of the tree. It's part of how it um, takes in air, if you will. Um, and I just don't ever see trees like that. Um, Anna and I were also very intrigued by when we started really researching the, the identity of the cypress tree, that cypress trees um, in text can often refer to like death, or the end of a cycle. And so it, there's all these other themes that are kind of fitting in together that made us really intrigued by this. Also, one thing to add is cypress trees are, are a protected flora and fauna in the sense that they, since they are disappearing, they're now considered protected. Um, so they're both like ubiquitous and also disappearing. So in this strange space of being a special de designation of, um, of, of a kind of uh, environment. I see. Well, thank you very much for your work and thank you and Anna both for your work. It's amazing and very resourceful. I think it's a great paradigm to also make everybody more sensitive for climate change and for what is ahead of us. So yeah, thank you again and thank you also Jessica for coordinating all this. Thank you. And of course, Thank you all for watching us, and I hope you had a pleasant experience. So, yeah. thank you see you in the so next home delivery me. episode. Okay. Sorry? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. These questions were really wonderful, and I'm really honored to have been able to be in conversation with all of you. Yeah, and everybody can always go into the video and watch them again. That's true. Okay, see you in the next home delivery episode. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ta -ta. Bye.